Hello again, folks. Firstly, yes, I'm absolutely fine. Thank you to the couple of people who emailed me asking that very question. I'm afraid it's, again, just a case of uh, real life getting in the way of YouTube. I've been really busy with working some other bits and pieces, uh, some other projects and yeah such like and i've just not had the time nor the inclination to get any content up so i do apologize for that so i'm getting my finger out and ease myself back into it tonight uh, i'm going to show you this piece of equipment here which is a grimes twin oscillating anti-collision lamp why am i going to show you that well first reason um or the main reason is it's pretty cool it's a uh, something from the 1950s it's an electromechanical light and it's pretty snazzy i like it <laughs> and the way it works is pretty smart as well but secondly it's uh, something i have to do anyway because i am restoring as i've mentioned in previous videos uh, an avril vulcan long-range strategic nuclear bomber from the cold war um, yeah x-ray lima 319 based at the northeast land sea and Air Museum down in Sunderland. Um, myself uh, as a project lead and a few other people are um, restoring that aircraft and one of the things we've got to do is get the exterior lighting up to scratch because in the 35 years that she's been sitting down in Sunderland, unfortunately kids, uh, well we think kids, maybe adults, uh, have been entering the site. Um, not for the last 20 years but um, yeah, in, in past times had been entering the site you know climbing over the fence and vandalizing uh not just the vulcan but other aircraft as well and unfortunately most of the exterior lighting has been damaged uh, pretty much beyond repair uh, to be totally honest so uh, digging about on uh, ebay etc etc i found this it was sold as an x vulcan lamp of uh, x-ray lima 445 I've since discovered that that cannot possibly be true because this is not the mounting plate on the Vulcan B2. Um, how do I know that? Well, of course, I've got a real Vulcan to compare it to. And if I bring in the one of the damaged lights off uh, the Vulcan that we're restoring, you can see that the configuration of the lamp is uh, completely different. This is mounted on a 3mm aluminium plate with you know the teardrop shape embossed into it. Uh, this one itself is a casting, um, which has a, a lip on it. But, um, as you can possibly see from looking through the glass, um, it is, to all intents and purposes, the same thing. If I tilt it on its side, now I have uh, removed the screws out of this uh, just to make it a bit easier to, to take it apart and show you inside. But if we look at the side, that's the same. If we look at the other side... That's the same on the end. We've got a blanket plate on the right and a blanket plate on this one. Uh, on the back end here, this one has got a cable gland. This one doesn't, it's just open. And if I tip it over this way, in fact, we'll do it that way. Um, you can see the cable's coming out there. But the, my, my point being is uh, these are you know, pretty much identical units, even down to the fact that this one here has got plates fitted with these rivets. There's rivets there, but no plates. So, what can I glean from, from what I've found out in terms of uh, serial numbers and this, that and the other? Well, Grimes is an American uh, manufacturer. They make uh, lights for the av aviation industry. This is a G9220. Uh, this is a G9950-13. It does say use Grimes lamps A9 uh, sorry A7097B. God, I can't even read. A7079B. <laughs> and if we look through the glass there, you may just be able to see. I get this to focus. Possibly not, but it does actually say a seven zero seven nine B. So the same bulbs, the same configuration, um, they're pretty much the same unit. But of course, we Brits, we don't like important stuff. Certainly not in the fifties and sixties. Rule Britannia, the British Empire, all that good stuff. Um, we like to design and manufacture our own British pieces of equipment. We couldn't have an American piece of equipment on a fully British nuclear bomber, could we? That's exactly what we did. We got Proly Grimes to manufacture these and ship them over in a 
box stuff with straw and all that good stuff and we had somebody in a factory here in the UK in some warehouse, RAF warehouse or Air Ministry warehouse as it was at the time, hand painting on with white paint our British stock number. Uh, this one dated from March 1969. Yeah, we bought off the shelf. We didn't design. Uh, we didn't design our own. This one, incidentally, is is Goose. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that the lens is broken, we do have spare lenses and bolts and all that good stuff. Um, this one is actually Goose. Um, what's happened to this one is there's a worm gear, a worm drive off the motor that goes on to the main gear. The main gear has lost a couple of teeth caused the mechanism to lock up the motor to overheat and one of the contacts on the commutator to actually fall off and further lock up the motor so um yeah disappointing that this one is is absolutely goose but reasonably content that we can reuse this plate on this one uh, or another one if we can get hold of them so yeah i'm kind of rambling on as i often do um, what's it for? What's it for? Well, I, I kind of alluded to it. It's an anti-collision light. And what does that mean? Well, it's to stop other planes from crashing into it. Now, clearly, if uh, we were um, operationally flying this aircraft and uh, we were going to bomb a target, now, clearly, we wouldn't be highlighting our position with a big flashy red lamp, would we? No, it's, it's more for uh, on training, you know, flying in formation with other aircraft, uh, you know, non-operationally. And of course, for movement on the ground, if somebody's flying around in a, a vehicle on an airfield, it just highlights uh, to those individuals that there is an aircraft there. Not that you would kind of miss it because it is a huge uh, piece of kit. But yeah, we didn't always have LEDs and Xenon um, strobes like this one here. Yeah, we had to have these big old clunky electromechanical things, much in the same way as our computers back in the 50s and 60s were big cogs and, you know, chains and this, that and the other that chunked down and to junk to junk to junk to junk and did all the things. It, you know, this is what, what we had to do. To have a moving light, we had to use cogs and gears and all that good stuff. And it results in actually quite a nice um, piece of equipment. I'll turn it on now. And as you can hear, it's fairly noisy. But doesn't that look good? Now, incidentally, there's two of these in the bottom of the Vulcan, and the bottom of our Vulcan's painted white. So when these are both operational, which will hopefully will be at some point, it's going to look rather smashing, um, at, you know, for night photography and stuff. That's going to look pretty smart. Um, incidentally, I don't know how my voice came through on that uh, segment when the when this was on. This is I'm filming this on a Note Nine, and I'll be totally honest with you, it's the second time I'm recording this because the first time the video started not glitching, but this was sitting here, and then two seconds later it, it would move there on screen. Um, I don't know if it was an auto focus or an image stabilization issue. I've put it on Pro mode. And it seems to be behaving itself. But um, if you could comment down below if you notice any glitches. And indeed if you could tell me how the audio quality on this uh, video is. Clearly the commentary is rubbish. But I'm actually talking about the quality of the audio itself. Uh, if you could comment down below, I'd greatly appreciate it. That's if you've not turned off by now. Okay, so let's uh, take it apart and show you how it works. So this is a single uh, long screw here that holds the, the lens on. 10 or 15 tons and it just comes out and then we just lift it off from the front here and just pull it out the back and lift it straight off now the bulbs here yeah they've cooled down sufficiently enough they are biased they've got um uh, a contact a, a stud sort of near the cap and one sort of, you know a third of the way up and that's just so you can only put them in one way now like i said there's a grimes is this focusing there we go grimes a7079b-2440 watt at 28 volts 28 volts dc um and it draws about about two um 2.9 amps, something like that. Um, what was I also going to say? Yeah, um, 28 volts, 40, uh, 40 watts. So the, the 
you've got 80 watts of incandescent uh, bulbs and you know whatever the rest of is you know making up the, the the draw on that is is the motor so the motor's probably drawing about you know maybe the point nine something like that um yeah it's, it's a fairly hefty draw but yeah most aircraft use 28 volts dc for this low voltage stuff and for the higher voltage in terms of generation and stuff like that uh, you know much higher voltages incidentally i've been powering this off a uh, cheapo uh, 24 volt power supply off amazon it's a uh yeah 24 volt uh, 5 amps you can adjust the voltage up to 31 volts uh, and i've powered this for several hours just to uh, test it and make sure it's not going to fail and test the power supply yet yeah, for several hours very 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 little heat generated and you know no problems at all running it at 28 volts so um how long it'll last i'm not sure but then again it was 12 quid so not too not too bothered about it um, so yeah, looking inside, um, we've talked about the two different form factors, uh, two screws there, two screws there, two screws there, bulb, bulb, motor, um, reasonably content that if I take out those six screws and those six screws and swap the plates over, we will have a working unit that can be inserted into the wing. Okay, right, let's take out these two screws. And then we can actually strip the thing apart and I can show you how it works inside. Now, if you notice here, I've actually just put a bit of um, power cable, I know a uh, bit of cable off a of, uh, Woolwatt or DC adapter, just so I could uh, retain the original plug here. Um, I, I can't, uh, I could probably could source a, a socket for that, but I just uh, thought it'd be easy just to to solder a bit of wire on inside just to test it so we'll take those last two screws out and give it a little bit of a jiggle the plate comes off and and we give this another jiggle there we go there's the the mechanism so yeah to build something like this nowadays you'd be using leds and electronically spinning them or not spinning them at all and just you know you know, have a, a a series of LEDs that you could electronically shift to give that movement. Of course, I couldn't do that back in the day. And look at the engineering that has, has went into this. It's uh, it's something else. So this one, um, I think I explained it. I can't remember if that was in the first video, the first attempt at the video, or in this one. But in the other one, we've lost a couple of these uh, teeth off this main gear here and it's fouled on the one drive causing the motor to fail let's say it overheated the commutator and one of the contacts the commutator has actually fallen off <coughs> excuse me so yeah the one drive here drives this gear which drives this other one gear in here it drives this uh cog which is on a what, what would you how would you describe that chris um I, I don't know. I don't know what the technical name for it is, but you've got a, a cam or a, this linkage here that's uh, off centre, if you like. It's on the edge. And as it goes round, it obviously causes this main cog to go back and forward and thus uh, rotating these two lamp holders through 180 degrees. And if I turn it on, I can show you that in uh, operation. There we go, I'll just try and focus. There we have it. So yeah, there's a one gear driving that. We've got another one gear onto this one here. This linkage is causing this main cog to oscillate back and forward and rotating in turn the two lamp holders. So how do we get the power to the lamps themselves? Well, that's quite... Um, both simple and quite complex at the same time. I will turn that off uh, and use the end bulb here as an example. So we've got one lamp holder here. We've got the outer sort of shell, if you like, which is going to make contact with these uh, studs on the bulbs. And in the middle, we've got this spring-loaded contact here. This spring-loaded contact comes through there. It goes down the middle of the shaft with an insulator surrounding it and then pops out at the bottom here onto this spring contact. So those two contacts join together uh, and allow the electricity to flow, the current to flow 
uh, through the shaft to that that contact there and on here the actual the ground of the, or the you know the metal of the actual mechanism itself we've got a carbon brush that goes on to the outer shaft here again with the insulator in between that and the center core and then um, that basically transfers electricity and the current to the the outer shell of the bulb um, much the same way as a commutator does on a, a, an electric motor so yeah it's it, it works it's it's a it's not over engineered it's been engineered to to fulfill a purpose because at the time there was nothing else that you could use to to move you know move two bulbs to give that desired effect you know we didn't they didn't have well they had some solid state stuff of course but you know in terms of leds and high output leds they just didn't exist um in the 1950s and 1960s hence we've got this uh, arrangement here but i think it's pretty cool and i think it's it's quite an interesting thing to to take apart and see how it functions um would you like to see the, see it with the bulbs in it Yes, okay, let's pop them in. If I can't. There we go, and these are uh, 100, 180 degrees out, of course. And if I turn it on now. Pretty bright with a, without the lamp on, it's actually blinding me. <laughs> yeah. Pretty smart. That's the power's come through this uh, shaft here, and again underneath, underneath there. And if I probably just lift it off, no, you can't even see it sparking. But if I just lift that off, you see that one goes out. Yeah. Okay, dogs. Well, we'll stop the video there. Um, hopefully, you found that interesting. Something you might not have known about, or when ordinarily have the opportunity to see inside of um interestingly enough these are still flying on current uh, modern aircraft um or reasonably modern aircraft you know they still do exist you can still buy these off the shelf how much do you think it would cost for one of these are you sitting down i found it in stock in an american website for a thousand dollars to get a replacement um motor to use in this other one here I can source one. It's going to cost seven hundred and twenty-five dollars. <laughs> Clearly not cost-effective, but um, they do. They are still out there. They are still in use. They are still flying over over in our skies, um, probably as we speak. So there we have it. Anyway, again, I will shut up rambling. Um, thank you very much indeed for watching. Hopefully, it won't be uh, so long until the next time. And uh, until the next time, do take care of yourselves. And as always, all the best.